Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Spencer. Uh, this is my third time now in the class uh, picking stocks and pitching them to different groups of people. Uh, this time around, I am doing Beyond Meat. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard about it, but it's a plant-based meat company. It's kind of taken the world by storm right now. Uh, I was going to pitch it last year, but I chose a different company over it. So it's time to see if we can invest in it this time around. So this is just a little overview of the presentation. Uh, we've got a lot to cover because it is a new and little, maybe a little less known company than say Chewy or some of the other companies that we're going to be investing in. So here we go. So Beyond Meats one of the, is the largest plant-based meat producer in the world right now. When I say in the world, I really mean the United States. They haven't breached the borders of the United States just yet, but they're on track to do so. Uh, they are taking on brands like General Mills, Conagra, and Tyson Foods, which all have different variations of plant-based meat, whether it's chicken, beef, steak. Uh, General Mills has even jumped into plant-based fish meats, which I'm not quite sure how they pulled that off, but it's, um, it's the industry we're looking into. So this is our investment thesis. One of the reasons I think that um, Beyond Meat is so exciting to invest in is how quickly their stock prices have gone up and have come back down, stabilized, and are now poised to go back up again. So over the course of their you know, time, they actually were founded in the early 2000s, and they've seen consecutive revenue growth every single year, no matter how small it's been, has continued to go up. The interesting part about Beyond Meat right now is we've had a little bit of correction. The stock price was well up over the 200 mark. It has now come down to 124. They've had some operational errors. They've said, you know, yes, we can fulfill these hundreds of thousands of orders to chains like McDonald's and Starbucks, and then come to find out, you know, it's a little harder to up open those supply chains when you're growing that quickly. So as you can see, there's three main driving factors why um, I think it, Beyond Meat would be a good investment. Uh, year over year growth, quarter over quarter growth, and every single year that they've gone public, now granted they've only been public for two years, they, their IPO launched in 2019, they beat Wall Street's expectations, which is incredibly rare for first time companies, especially first time companies that are in an industry that is not really well established. When I say Beyond Meat's pioneering, you know, through this industry, they legitimately are the only company that's public, besides Impossible Burger and Meat, that is actually pr producing plant-based products and doing it well, and has a devout following of customers. Just for those reasons, I think we should definitely be considering this further. So I have to be honest and put out um, the risk to investment. Bowdoin would not like it if I did not you know, share all the uh, risks of this company. It falls in the top category here, I would say right in between moderate and high risk, but I would put it more in the high risk area because it is so new and it is on the forefront of the industry. You know, They're going to make the most amount of mistakes because they're the first ones doing it. So a few of the you know, more basic risks to this company has to do with foreign exchange and inflation. Now, Beyond Meat, sources a lot of their like um, their seeds and vegetables and all the materials that's not meat based from outside the country. So their supply chains are coming from Asia, some parts of India they're getting them from. So that's an incredible risk in the fact that, especially with the global pandemic going on, anything that happens on that side of the world will absolutely affect their operations here, which moves them into the high risk category. You know, how, no matter how well their company is being run, you know, China or India or any of those countries could shut down and, you know, jeopardize their supply chain greatly. This is their management overview. It's just common to have them in these presentations. But the first guy here is the driving force behind, behind me. He was actually turned down 10 times before finally getting some startup money to start this company. So this is Ethan Brown. He's the founder. He's the CEO. Uh, he's also on the board of directors. And I could not imagine being turned down nine times for an idea of something like this and still going forward. So it does speak to his leadership skills and capabilities. This is his second in command, the chief financial officer. The two of them actually had this idea. They knew each other prior to starting this company. I forget either they worked at Amazon or Tesla, one of the two together, and they had this you know, great idea. Both of them are vegetarians. So that's where the plant-based meat came out of. They got sick of tasting you know, things like tofu and stuff like that. They wanted the feeling and taste of a burger without it being a burger. This is the guy behind actually coming up with the ideas and spearheading the research behind Beyond Meat, which made it possible. Uh, this guy is one of the most accomplished people I think I've ever read about. Uh, I don't have enough space on the slide to list the amount of companies he's worked for. These include Tesla, he's worked for Ford, he's worked for Amazon, 
He's worked for Walmart. He's done all these crazy, all on high level, you know, not just base jobs. He's been executive level for all these companies for years. And now he's at Beyond Meat. So they're in pretty good hands in terms of management. This is the industry outlook, and this is what makes Beyond Meat incredibly interesting. So if you look, I don't know how well everyone can see it, but in the year 2025, see how it says 27.9? That's the, that's the estimated market share that this company or the plant-based meat industry is going to have. If you look in North America, look at how far it's grown up. It's gone up since 2018. Now keep in mind, Beyond Meat really became on the scene right here in 2019, right on the cusp as the market share just increased, went through the roof. What's leading this is the fact that many people are starting to stray away from meat. You no, know, everyone's starting to realize the health side effects and you know, maybe we should be taking care of ourselves better. But nobody's prepared to give up, you know, that feeling everybody likes to taste a good steak. You know, everybody wants to have a, you know, fried chicken. They want something that tastes like chicken, looks like chicken, but is not chicken. And this is where Beyond Meat comes in. So you can see these projections, they're going up. Beyond Meat is literally the only company in this sector that's public. So the whole blue and green is where they're aiming to do business. This is their peer group. And I use the word peer group lightly because Beyond Meat's dedicated their entire company, 100% of their revenue comes from plant-based meats, chickens, and things of the such. These other three are incredibly large companies that have very, very small niche markets in the plant-based sector of meats. Um, as I said in the beginning, General Mills is now in the plant-based fish meat sector. I have the name of them over here. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried it before. It does not sound too appetizing to me, but it's called Gardein. Uh, Tyson Foods has a similar one. It's called The Blend. Uh, those two, actually the General Mills and Tyson Foods came out with this plant-based meat in response to Beyond Meat's uh, you know, more popularity. They tried to diversify a little bit and they're doing an all right job. They don't quite have the following Beyond Meat does, but then again, these are you know multinational, huge corporations that have you know, other resources and other revenue streams other than, you know, just plant-based products. Same with Conagra. They have this, another section of their industry that's um, focusing on plant-based meats as well. They've yet to catch up to Beyond Meat. As you can see, you know, revenue is a little bit different and you compare revenues for, you know, Tyson Foods versus Beyond Meat. But the next slide will explain why Beyond Meat's a little bit more attractive. So if you break down just their meat segments and these companies, Beyond Meat blows them away. So therefore, I believe they're not quite in the same peer group you know, section. You can compare them, but not, not really. Uh, this also speaks to why Beyond Meat is so attractive. You know, Conagra, Tyson, and General Mills are huge, huge companies, and Beyond Meat's outpacing them by not just you know, a couple million dollars, at least 100 plus in every sector. This is their market share, which is also super interesting and why we should consider investing in a little bit more. So if you look in 2014, just before their IPO, they were in about a thousand stores. Every year that it's gone up, you see just after their IPO in 2019, it rockets right up to 80,000 and 112,000. That was right where people started taking Beyond Meat really seriously and they were able to totally implement their supply chain and operational like standards. The CFO and as you saw the CEO, they were totally able to perfect the supply chain so that when McDonald's or, you know, Walmart, Publix, Stop and Shop said, you know, we do need 50,000 more burgers, they were able to meet that demand. That led to an increase in their stock price and their stock was pretty much on fire to just before COVID hit. This is another comparison just to put in perspective how well the company's doing. It's a relatively self-explanatory graph, but this is their um, change in price per unit. So as you can see, because Beyond Meat devotes most its entire company and idea to producing this product, it's going to outpace all these other companies 100% of the time. They just simply can't compete in the whole plant-based meat industry. Now we're getting into the financials. So if you look here at their revenues, this is their three major, or two, two major, they haven't breached the international sector yet. This is their two major segments of where they draw their revenues from. As I said, the revenues consistently gone up year over year over year. I wish I could find a graph that was this pretty for 2020, but we'll have to stick with 2019 instead. Right around here where it says 37 and 104, we saw in the retail section, we saw an increase in the stock price by 115%. I don't have the exact number for where it jumped up. It went from 
70 something, I believe, to right around like 180, and it plateaued over there. That's because two major food brands got behind them totally. You can find Beyond Meat in all Walmart stores. Amazon, obviously, everyone knows, bought Whole Foods. Shortly after that, plant based meats became a staple of Whole Foods. Beyond Meat was the first, with the Impossible Burger, which is a private company, was the first plant based company to be carried in all Whole Foods locations. They were riding pretty high off that stock. Then when you come here, this is also we're getting into a little bit more of a few financials. Did it disappear? Can you guys still see this? We can see it. Okay, I wasn't sure. It just like glitched out here for a second. So you can look at the valuation. This company's only two years old and it's right around 8.6 or $10.1 billion in its valuation overall. In comparison here, as you go down, you can see the incredible growth that it's experienced. And it's just, it's all, it blows my mind how interesting this company is and how quickly they're able to grow and sustain their growth. This is their revenue since they IPO'd. It's good to visualize some of this stuff because I can sit here and say, you know, all day long, the stock's gone up, the stock's gone up, the stock's gone up. But as you can see, it, it truly has gone up with a few minor dips here, but it's really not dipped below 120, 130, you know, stock price whatsoever. And this is where I believe our investment fund comes in. You know, we could get on board at something that, you know, could be upwards of 180, as you can see, you know, mid summer, the price was over $200 a share. It's now trading a little bit lower, which gives us the opportunity to make some wise investment decisions and get on board with it. So this is their revenue combined. I just wanted to put it into a visual of, you know, how they came up with the revenue and how it's distributed. Oftentimes, you know, companies will say, yeah, you know, we do really well overall, but you don't get to break down and see truly where, you know, the money's coming in from. Beyond Meats drives, takes the revenue 100% split right down the middle between restaurants and retail. Retail is the fastest growing segment for the company where restaurants kind of like lag behind a little bit. But overall, you can see those are some pretty strong results all the way through. So if you dive deep into the company's financials, anybody who knows anything about a balance sheet would be a little concerned with it. Beyond Meat tends to make a lot of money and then they tend to spend a lot of money. And in the past two years, prior to their IPO, they were spending a lot more than they were taking in. They were pouring money into research and development, operational supply chains, trying to expand their markets. And they actually, they still had a negative and still do right now, have a negative EPS as a result of that. Now this is fairly common for companies that are starting up, you know, they're trying to get their stuff together. Beyond Meat's in a little bit different circumstance because they're the real first company kind of pioneering this industry. So a lot of the revenue does get poured back into their company and a lot of the profits also get poured back in. So from a necessarily, you know, investor standpoint, the company is not necessarily, you know, in a hundred percent standing in terms of, you know, we're spending a lot of the revenue back on research and development. What makes it super interesting is they usually take care of their investors prior to doing this. So since their IPO, they've never not been able to deliver dividends and such with their investors. They've always you know, made sure they take care of it. Now that tends to be pulled right from their cash as opposed to taking out of their profits, but as long as they can keep their investors happy, the company will continue on. The long-term growth is also what hedges this balance sheet and what keeps it going. If this was going the other way, as you can see here, in, 2019, say 2019 was right around 37 or 38, you know, million dollars in the net cash that they had on hand for operating, you know, I'd be a little bit more concerned. But every year it's continued to go up, which leads me to believe that in the next one to two years, this company will go positive, which will be incredible for investors and hopefully incredible for the fund if we decide to invest in it. So this visualizes should wrap, this is going to wrap up everything. It's um, a graph that we, I've put together to show where we are right now. Based on our DCF analysis that we did with Professor Bowden, I was able to project that this company should hit around $183.03 a share by January of 2021. And then took a few of these numbers and plugged them in to show you where I think Beyond Meat could be going on the same trajectory we're using based on our predictions. So if you look, revenue is going to go through the roof, at least according to our projections, in 2022 all the way up. See so where the star is, that represents where we could be getting on board. We would be foolish if we didn't seriously consider investing in this company based on where we could get in and where they could be going. Now, free cash and cash flow operations and earnings 
you know, those are going to take a little bit for the company to work itself out. I mean, it is a new company and it is going to continue to grow, but they do need the cash and they do need to be able to invest that into their research and development and operations. So overall, if we get in on the ground floor of this company, and now this presentation is a week old, the stock price has gone down just a little bit. You may have heard there's been a little bit of drama with McDonald's and opening up uh, Beyond Meat into their retail chain. We could be seeing an even greater growth here if we get in now, as opposed to where I'm even projecting. Beyond Meat's trading at 130 as of this morning, I believe, 131, which is at least $50 lower than where I projected. So if we were able to get it on the ground floor now, we can make a profit by January. And if we continue to follow the revenue growth as the company's you know, going to experience, we could be making incredible amounts of profit. It's for this reason, I believe we should be investing in this company. I think um, Beyond Meat's got it's stuck together and I think it's a super interesting company that's going to be on the forefront of the plant-based meat sector for years to come. And I think we're going to truly see a whole shift in how we view food and how we consume food and beyond meats, definitely a company that's going to be right there in the thick of it, you know, competing with all these major brands. And I think we should be getting on the ground floor. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can you go over a little bit what's going on with McDonald's? Yep. So as I said before, um, Beyond Meat and has a tends, tends to make, you know, a promise, you know, McDonald's says, well, we only need, you know, 50,000 burgers from you. Well, they roll they ended up rolling them out and it turns out they went over really well. Uh, now Beyond Meat's a new company, so it doesn't necessarily have, you know, an additional 50,000 burgers hanging around. So it took a little bit for them to kind of meet McDonald's demand. Uh, that's what kind of dipped the stock price. Now that's happened a couple times over because companies have underestimated how much you know, their customers and consumers are going to enjoy the product. It happened with Starbucks, and it also happened most recently in the grocery store chain. It happened with Walmart. Walmart wasn't sure that their customer base was even going to really understand what plant-based meat, and it's all online, you can read about it. I'm not being you know, sarcastic saying they wouldn't understand what it was. Uh, and so Walmart only requested, I forget, some very small amount of burgers in each of their stores, and they ended up selling out. And because Beyond Meat so new and spread so thin now, it's just they had some hard times, you know, meeting those operational demands. But they've worked it out with Walmart. Now they're working it out with McDonald's. Um, what company supplies Burger King for their, um, I know they have a plant-based Whopper Impossible. or something. Who is that? Impossible Burger. Okay. So it's a Beyond Meat competitor. They are a 100% private company. They are not public. Uh, okay. They are in, they're in two other retail locations as well. I don't know them off the top of my head, but they're not quite as widespread as Beyond Meat. Um, okay. They've been around a little bit longer, but they haven't been able to kind of get their stuff together like Beyond Meat could. Okay, so based on the revenue growth they've experienced, you see that continuing and that helps your valuation of 183, is that correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Side note to that, I did try the Beyond Meat burger last night. I bought them at Price Chopper and Webster. And we made them, um, I made them for my roommates and I, and they are pretty good. I mean, they're as close to a burger as you'd probably get, um, which was a little weird knowing that you're eating plants, but. Hmm. So would you try them again? I would, I would absolutely try them again. Actually, we were going to try the chicken. Uh, All right. It seems like, you know, why not? But I would highly recommend trying them. And as you know how in a burger, you get that greasiness out of it. There's none of that in, it tastes like a burger, but you know, you don't get all the bad stuff with it. So well, I'm glad you tried it and uh, endorsed the product that, that helps. <laughs> right. Does anyone else have any questions? I have a question about, um, and I'm, I'm a fan of, of the brand and of uh, fake meats in general, um, <laughs> so I don't eat meat. Um, so I've tried um, most of them, um, Gardein's as well. Uh, and so my question is about growth. So you, uh, you say you're predicting growth and I noticed that you talked about um, the increase in distribution because you know obviously sale increases can come from greater distribution or greater sales in those distribution venues. So is there room for distribution growth, particularly on the, um, on the retail side or have they capped out? So if they're in Walmart, they're in Whole Foods, um, are they already sort of capped at where they could be on that side of things? I think as far as retail, you're right. Uh, you know, they are in a lot of those major brands. Obviously there's, I'm sure there's grocery stores that are not, that, you know, they're not in. Uh, 
I think that where their real growth is going to come from is the increase in the market share within those stores. You know, so Walmart's, hey, they're only selling a thousand, you know, burgers. As Beyond Meat gets out there more and more, you know, they could be sending Walmart four, five, six thousand burgers. Uh, and the restaurant piece will drive it too. But I think where the growth is going to come from is the growth within those brands. So as they get a more loyal customer base, as you said, you know, you've tried a few different meats, you know, you might fall in love with Beyond Meat and start buying, you know, more of them regularly. That's where I believe the growth is going to be because they were able to feed into those locations so early on. Now they just have to build their reputation and brand with those brands, within those brands. Spencer, what sector does this company fall in? So I want to say it falls in the consumer discretionary sector because okay. you know, it's, but we don't really, you know, it's not like we have a plant-based meat section. So yeah. I wasn't really sure really where to put it. Uh, it's also a food. So, you know, is it considered a consumer staple? I don't know. Uh, hmm. I think it definitely in terms of like, you know, riskiness for the investment fund, I think that it falls in, you know, a little bit more diversified company. You know, it's not Microsoft or Facebook, you know, it's something that, you know, we could be, you know, one of the first people to invest in kind of thing. Okay. Any other questions? Do the uh, Beyond Meat burgers, do they tend to be cheaper or more expensive than the uh, regular burgers? I thought they were like regular meats. super expensive. I, I think we paid like three or four dollars for it. It was like a two pack. You know, I don't, I don't remember it being too, too expensive at all. Uh, but, you know, we only did bought, you know, three burgers. So I'm sure if you're buying them in a little bit larger quantity, you know, it might cost a little bit more. But it is more expensive to produce a plant-based burger than, you know, a meat patty. Is that something that's impacting their uh, their losses at the point then as well? The they, production uh, costs. Their, their um, annual report. They didn't really, you know, say much about you know the cost. It was kind of you know implied that it is going to cost a lot more than a burger, and you know they're going to have to make it up. So I didn't see that hindering you know their ability. To, usually, people who are going to buy you know something plant based or more healthy are okay paying a little bit more for that. So. Okay. Right. I do have a follow-up question about that because I know that they're, I think they're more expensive than other, and you actually had a, your slide 14. Is that, that's what you're talking about? They've increased their price per unit. Is that what you mean by that? Like the retail cost? Yep. So I wonder as, you know, with any industry, once it becomes more mainstream, as if there's growth in the, um, you know, vegetarian meat, uh, there's like been more pressure on price to come down. So do you think that's going to impact their profitability as, you know, as there are, is more um, competition and um, greater sales, typically there becomes more pressure on pricing. I wonder if it's, I, I thought about this and I was wondering if it would go the other way, you know, as those other companies kind of, you know, fine tune their meats products I think they're going to find that it is going to cost a lot more to make a better product. So I think, you know, in terms of slide 14 in the next five to 10 years, we'll see those numbers kind of balance up. Maybe Beyond Meat will come down a little bit, but I can't imagine they're going to want to adjust their price too much because of how much, you know, burger does cost to make. I see the other companies kind of raising it a little bit, you know, to meet that. You know, Beyond Meats, as I said, it looks just like a burger. You know, when you fry it, it sounds just like a burger. Uh, and I don't believe that that's the same with the other variations. You know, I'm pretty sure you can tell that it's really not chicken or really not meat. Uh, and so that leads to probably the cheaper price. So I see those stabilizing a little bit, at least in, in my opinion, I think. Spencer, in your Thank research, you. was there any indication that Beyond Meat's um, long-term or ultimate goal is to be bought out by one of these larger companies, or do they seem to want to stay um, independent? Based, based on everything, you know, that I've read, I don't, foresee that they haven't indicated that that's their goal. Uh, right now, their total, you know, drive is to be worldwide with this whole thing. They're trying to expand, you know, without, with, you know, outside the United States. Uh, I have not seen any indications that they're hoping to be bought out. That being said, that does not mean Tyson or some of those other major foods are going to try, you know, to buy them out. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you.